Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Peter Giuliano. I am the, uh, the Chief Research Officer of the Specialty Coffee Association and the Executive Director of the Coffee Science Foundation. And welcome to our, uh, our session this morning. Um, before we start, I, I uh, have to thank um, all of our sponsors for Expo Weekend um, that you're participating in right now. Um, and the title sponsor is uh, P uh, Pacific Barista Series, um, and um, but also uh, Saver Brands, Chemex, and Rose Stars are underwriters. So thank you very much to all those sponsors that are making this possible. So as we head into the um, talk, I encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A tab to the right of the chat tab, and then um, we'll be able to get to those, uh, those questions at the end. So now to introduce our presenter. Um, today's presenter is Jennifer Vern Long, and she is the CEO of World Coffee Research. Um, Vern is a plant be breeder by training, and she brings 25 years of experience in international agricultural research with a focus on smallholders and a deep expertise on genetic research resources policy. Before joining WCR, Long served as the director of the Office of Agricultural Research and Policy in the U.S. Agency for International Development, aka USAID, where she managed a global program portfolio of over $140 million per year. So welcome, Vern. Are you there, Vern? Yes. Good morning. All right. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Take it away. Okay, great. Wonderful. Wonderful to be with you all this morning. And thanks for, for dialing in from all over the world. So today, what I'd like to do <clears throat> is talk about why preserving origin diversity is uh, so important for coffee. <clears throat> I'd like to start by what I mean by origin diversity. Origin diversity is about a global community. This slide shows shipping traffic all around the world, just to give you a flavor of the dynamism we're talking about, a tremendous global community. This is just how interconnected we are. Origin diversity is about the vibrant coexistence of coffee growers from around the world, contributing their skills and effort to produce an array of coffees with different flavors and experiences. Origin diversity creates opportunities for roasters and baristas interested in showcasing coffee's many dimensions. While coffee does grow on trees, successful production relies on a tremendous amount of knowledge, experience, and technology. And it's this origin diversity that's about a truly, it's the truly amazing part about coffee that it's produced all around the world and it's enjoyed by consumers all around the world. So when we think about where it's been grown and this idea of origin diversity, it's something that's been tremendously dynamic over the ages. Obviously, um, starting in the 1700s, uh, Af the African continent was the source of supply. Uh, by 1830, coffee production shifted to the Western hemisphere in Asia. And in the most recent century, African coffee production has risen and then receded. These trends hint at a story and we'll embark on this together by framing the plot in the story and then identifying the characters. <clears throat> so let's start with the plot. So why does origin diversity matter? Origin diversity underpins the long-term sustainability of the global coffee industry. Fundamentally, origin diversity mitigates risks for supply chains. Being able to buy coffee from multiple world regions is an increasingly, in an increasingly unpredictable world allows business to nimbly respond to unexpected events. From the farmer's perspective, origin diversity allows for the distribution of opportunity to farmers around the world to participate in exports. According to Enveritas' data, 66% of the world's coffee is grown by smallholders who farm less than 20 hectares, and they represent 98% of coffee forms. More than 50 countries grow coffee commercially. That's a pretty broadly distributed community that brings the world something more than just risk management. Farmers bring us 
an array of a diverse array of quality coffees. Coffee tastes different depending on the elevation at which you grow it, the soil type, and you know as well the variable differences, which I'm sure you've heard us talk about quite a bit. <clears throat> Origin diversity is what brings us the excitement in the cup. As many of us hunkered down at home amidst the pandemic of a lifetime, it's easy to forget about the far larger present threat posed by the climate crisis. As we think about the myriad challenges facing us in the 21st century, we must pivot from the efficiency-seeking models of the 20th century to more resilient systems in the 21st. With the climate crisis, we need to consider ways to address resilience and our exposure to our supply chains risk as an industry. Beyond risk mitigation, or diversity brings us a diversity of flavor experiences, from unique single origin coffees to single estate coffees, and then combining an array of distinctive flavors to generate new experiences. In my own household, we've become particularly excited about a blend from Rwanda and Papua New Guinea that involves four different varietals. It's this creative mix of growers from two completely different parts of the world, providing the glorious ingredients to the artistic palette of those of you who keep these amazing combinations coming at us in the market. Quality and differentiation keeps consumers interested and diversity of origins helps us tell the story of our partners across the globe and keeps consumers engaged. Origin diversity also distributes opportunity for millions of farmers to participate in the production of an export crop. It's critical to remember, especially when we've been experiencing a period of sustained low prices, that there's a reason that farmers grow coffee. For many, it's a way of life passed down from their parents or their grandparents, but it's also a business. And those revenues from coffee production don't just go to coffee farmers, but extend across all the actors in the supply chain in coffee origin countries. Coffee exports generate revenues for countries. In fact, in some countries, coffee represents a significant share of the value of exports. According to the ICO statistics in their 2019 report, in Ethiopia, 24% of the value of exports comes from coffee. And in Timor-Leste, it's 51%. I'll come back to this point as we revisit and think about the plot of this story in a bit. So to whom does origin diversity matter? As we take a step back and think about for whom diversity matters, we need to identify each of the characters in this story. So let's start with the obvious. Green coffee suppliers and roasters. Since origin diversity reduces risk for supply chains and offers unique qualities for buyers in a global market, it's green coffee suppliers and roasters for whom these factors are important to the bottom line in the business. Origin diversity may seem to be irrelevant for an individual producer in any single country, but consider a thought experiment in which Brazil produces 100% of the coffee globally, instead of about roughly 35% in recent years. What happens to producers in every other country? Support to strengthening origin diversity matters for producers broadly, affording them continuation, the opportunity to continue a livelihood that they know and love and distributing the wealth that coffee can generate. But producers can't just use the production methods of their grandparents and expect to stay afloat in a global economy. Innovation is critical. Producers need to optimize their operations to ensure profitability, such as by improving yield or output per worker, or often both. But we aren't just talking about maximizing profits from a single crop, but optimizing what works for smallholders and their families. Maybe it, it involves diversifying their cropping production systems. You'll see here on the right of the slide, you know, the intercropping with groundnuts in Rwanda, onions in the Philippines, and pepper in India. And it's you know, really about reducing price exposure, or reducing their exposure to price volatility in coffee. But they'll need to adjust to what works for them in the context of local, regional, and global markets. As they adjust, they'll want innovations that help reduce production risk, improve profitability, and enhance overall welfare for their families and their communities. The bottom line is that farmers like to have choice and having the option to participate in production of a globally traded export crop like coffee can offer a significant opportunity for farmers and their countries. So the question is, how does origin diversity come about? Though we all talk about roasters, green coffee suppliers and farmers, 
when we talk about the global coffee industry and sustainability programming, we also know that one successful farmer cannot single-handedly support all of the big systems that are needed for coffee to thrive at a country level. You need roads, you need mills, and to fill those mills and shipping containers, you need enough successful farmers. That leads us to consider a character that is often left out of the story of coffee. It's history and where we find ourselves in the present moment, countries. I wanna bring in countries as it's really been absent from the narrative. Before coming to WCR, I worked in government where we supported research collaborations between universities, international agricultural research centers and national governments of low and middle income countries. And we supported hundreds of millions of dollars of agricultural development programs. All these investments in agriculture were designed to support the national development strategies countries laid out for the global donor community. Or at least that was the goal, that was our ambition. So you see, governments invest in agriculture not because it's easy or because it's the latest development fad, but because investments in agriculture lead to transformation of the whole economy. It's countries, national governments, that through their policies, regulations and investments create the enabling environment within which our community operates. And I'm gonna get a little wonky here, but it's, it's really important. <laughs> to improve the functioning of the coffee sector within many countries, to maintain origin diversity, we need to make sure that all the actors in our community, in each country, and absolutely the government of that country, whether it's local, uh, regional, or you know, national government, that they're all at the table. We need to work together inclusively through collaboration and partnership to enhance country competitiveness and ultimately farmer welfare. Without the right policies and country level support, we're missing a key link in this network and a critical voice at the table. When I arrived in the coffee community last year, I've been thinking about how we often don't hear about national plans or national strategies. We hear about farmers, but not about the broader context in which farmers are operating, the country context. This country context matters for how much we support farmers and how they get, you know, what they can get to participate in and benefit from the production of an export crop. While origin diversity is important for roasters and retailers to keep your businesses moving forward, it's also really important for national economies. Economic diversification is important for national economies. And by diversification, I mean they need to be working in manufacturing, in services, in addition to agriculture. Coffee, like other exported goods, affords an opportunity for generating export revenues that can pay for imports of capital goods that can raise productivity in other economic sectors. In addition, the foreign exchange generated from coffee exports lets countries import goods, everything from textbooks for schools, equipment for hospitals, inputs for building infrastructure like roads and bridges. While agriculture-led economic growth leads to transformation of economy, the role of export crops in this process is largely related to the foreign exchange it generates. Not completely, but that's a big part. As governments think about just how to allocate resources to foster economic growth, looking at which exports are generating the most value is key. In a few countries, coffee exports generate a significant amount of value relative to other exports. In these countries, we'd expect they're motivated to support national efforts to maintain competitiveness in global coffee markets, and they're really important that we think about that. So when we think about what prosperous economies look like, we often think about countries where agriculture is an afterthought by most of the population, countries where agriculture contributes only a small part of national GDP, and agriculture isn't a big player in exports. Then there's New Zealand, a country of less than 5 million people and they export between 70 and 95% of their primary agricultural products like dairy and wool and wine. When we think about the livelihoods of New Zealand farmers, we can start to imagine the possibilities for how an export crop that we all love and wanna continue buying can be part of a prosperous economy where farmers are at the center of that economic opportunity. But governments have to make choices and there are a lot of competing choices. However, by raising coffee productivity, a country can become more competitive in international markets. If coffee exports remain competitive, coffee can continue to be an important part of the economy even as the country gets wealthier. So the question is, how do we get there? So not every country can emulate New Zealand. 
But we need to think about the kinds of capacity that's currently resident in many origin countries, capacities and systems that are there because the country's government is prioritizing coffee. If we wanna protect origin diversity, we must work with national governments. When you're on the outside of government, you cannot imagine how hard their job is. National government officials of low income countries are pulled in a million directions. They have so many challenges to confront all the time. So yes, it can be hard to get their attention, but that's why we as an industry have to be organized and bring them in and bring them along so they can imagine how this one piece of the puzzle in their whole national economy, this puzzle piece of coffee can fit into this 3D huge jigsaw puzzle that they're putting together every day, their national economy. <clears throat> as we think about this issue, I wanna take you to this map and a jump back in time. It's a map of the first transatlantic telegraph cable. Prior to this, it took one week for a message to cross the Atlantic, more like a month most of the time. What is the reason that the first cable was laid between the US and Britain? One, because they had business to do. And two, because they had a telegraph relay system already in place on the mainland. Because what's the point of sending a telegraph all the way across the ocean if there's no system on the mainland ready and able to relay it? When we think about preserving origin diversity, capacity of a country or willingness of a country to build and strengthen this capacity, it's important. Are they ready for a telegraph to be relayed or do they have capacity at a sufficient level to be able to move to the next level and drive significant gains for their farmers? And if they're not, what's needed to get them there? As we think about this more deeply, here's a comparison of two countries in Central America. This table illustrates some useful information when we think about the challenges before us with respect to preserving origin diversity. Country competitiveness has a big impact on farmer realities. If coffee is important to a government's bottom line, they are likely to be more invested in keeping this sector competitive. Country investments to enhance competitiveness matter a lot. Let's compare Honduras and El Salvador. In Honduras, coffee generates about 23% of export revenues, while in El Salvador, it's less than 3%. When we look at blunt measures of the economy, we see that agricultural gross domestic product is positive in Honduras, but coffee production is double that. The coffee production growth is double that. This is a strong indication that the sector is strong, the country's committed, and given the importance for export revenue generation, they're motivated. You can see by their production trend, that's the green line over on the right at the top, the national investment's paying off. The same can't be said for El Salvador. The, the context is just not conducive to coffee success, and it makes sense. The government may not prioritize coffee because it isn't a significant generator of export revenue, or perhaps something's changed in the global markets, or new innovations were on the horizon, which might change the calculation. The government might shift priorities then. But as far as looking at current production trends and what motivates countries to continue contributing to global coffee supply, Preserving origin diversity of some origins will require extra attention. To sum this up, when countries are no longer competitive, they will slip into sustained decline, which threatens their existence as a coffee origin. Of course, some farms or farmers will remain, but it will be that much harder to stay viable and more expensive for them and obviously for you. Further, when countries are competitive, the conditions are in place to help farmers succeed. The next question, is just what is the current state of origin diversity across the globe. <clears throat> so the good news is that coffee is not yet cocoa, where three countries produce a significant proportion of global cacao. That said, the relative proportion of countries contributing to global coffee production is not great, and the macro trends are, look, are important to look at. So we should look at you know, what's the biggest trend that we're seeing. When we compare the magnitude of the trend of change in production volumes, looking at the gray box on the left and the two steep lines representing Brazil and Vietnam, we see that enhancing country competitiveness is going to require focused attention. It, can't, it can seem like we're in an age of origin, origin diversity. When you go to the grocery store, there are so many distinctive products on the shelves, but looking at the trends in production volumes reminds us that we need to go up to 30,000 feet where we can see the big picture. So just to clarify, this chart is basically production volumes, the tons of coffee produced. So currently 70% of coffee is produced by five countries. 10 years ago, it was seven countries. 
A number of recent reports, the Jeffrey Sachs reports from last year and the ICO report from 2019, show that 80% of the global production increase since the 1990s comes from just two countries, Brazil and Vietnam. They're consolidating their advantage. It's harder for other countries to keep up, especially ones with higher costs of production. We need to think about why that is and what constellation of actions can be taken together to strengthen origin diversity. If we as an industry want to continue the benefits of risk mitigation to our supply chains, continuing access, continued access to a diversity of qualities, and as countries and producers want to participate in an important export market, we have to really think that through. What's it going to take? If we're up here at 30,000 feet, what else can we look at to understand the big picture, where things are now, and what might need to change? To understand some of the drivers of production trends in agriculture, we can look at different measures to understand what's going on. Reasons why countries become uncompetitive vary. Some choose to let coffee go as they pursue other opportunities. Sometimes they try, but just don't have the right tools, be, them, be they policy or technical. Or, politi or political or economic shifts change the options that governments have. And climate change has already been playing a significant part. It's super clear that one basic reason is that countries haven't been able to, haven't been able to or chosen to invest in ag R&D for coffee. Agricultural R&D generates the innovations and knowledge to help countries maintain or regain their competitiveness in global markets. Coffee isn't alone in being underinvested in, but lower levels of ag R&D investment have consequences for competitiveness. The ones who can invest do, and it pays off like we see with Brazil. We're gonna look at this through the ends of ag R&D because that's what we do at WCR and it's our expertise. When governments focus their investments in coffee ag R&D, they won't only be focused on the short-term goal of improving profitability for smallholder farmers, but about transformation of coffee agriculture to a vibrant sector of the, of the economy where coffee farmers are profitable and, prosper and prosperous at a scale that affords opportunities for farm families and the broader economy, something that affords choice for those families. So this chart is taken from the Agricultural Science and Technology Indicator Program, which is facilitated by the International Food Policy Research Institute. Uh, at the end of this talk, actually, we're gonna make sure that everybody has access to all these links because some of these um, interactive websites are really interesting to understand these different indicators and how, how um, and they're all uh, really user-friendly. So this chart simply shows the ratio of agricultural research and development spending to the share of agricultural GDP. So if agriculture is a big part of your economy, like New Zealand, you would expect that you'd spend relatively more on ag R&D. Basically, if a country is spending between one and 2%, this is considered a reasonable level of investment. So you can see over here on the left that Brazil has 1.82%, and this is agriculture at large, not just coffee, but that's a, a really good indicator that their level of investment is really right-sized for the importance of ag in their broader economy. So this is a ballpark figure, and it's a good way to compare. Of course, there are caveats like efficiency of investment, other sources of research supply in a country, or regional spillovers, where you have research coming from one country helping another country. But the basic idea, it's just helpful to compare. While governments can't control global coffee market prices, they can control how much they spend on coffee R&D and ensure it's targeted to areas that contribute to enhanced competitiveness. These indicators over here uh, de demonstrate whether countries are investing in the areas over which they do have control, investments that will figure into whether origin diversity um, will continue at a global level. So what does it take to support origin diversity? Frankly speaking, there is no magic solution, but the building blocks are in place. At WCR, we embarked on a global consultation process this year to define the shared agenda around how we can support research and development priorities towards the goal of preserving origin diversity. We interviewed 135 stakeholders from across the supply chain that included national researchers, roasters, traders, farmers, and farmer associations. We also launched a survey in partnership with SCA, NCA, the British Coffee Association and the Swiss Traders that yielded 896 responses from across the community. The global consultation process revealed shared concern and some common priorities, but also a concerning lack of coordination among countries in the private sector. Most of our interviewees across the supply chain had no idea what their, co their country's coffee plan priorities were, 
even if they knew that there was a coffee, a national coffee strategy in the country. So what matters is there is significant will among countries and industry to think about this for all the reasons I described today. There's really a win-win scenario out here that we can construct and advance. Multi-stakeholder platforms are being stood up and countries have national coffee strategies that can serve as a focal point for the community. There are many efforts trying to tackle this through ICO, ECF, Producers Forum, and the GCP to name a few. These global efforts will help sort through stakeholder responsibility and allow the community to work towards mutual accountability. In most national coffee strategies, R&D is a component. Countries put it there for a reason. It matters to the bottom line. R&D can uniquely address some of the underlying drivers, pressure on production, especially, which is amplifying given the greater variability in production environments from climate change. But for R&D investments to deliver, it isn't enough just to throw money at an agenda. It's about ensuring it's spent efficiently and on the right things. Demand-led approaches to research are critical to ensure that precious resources are focused on the right things and that we accelerate impact because farmers and national economies cannot wait forever. Fundamentally, supporting origin diversity means supporting country competitiveness, increasing the size of their toolboxes. That means aligning priorities, and it's really hard to do, but it turns out it's the only way to do it, to solve these complex problems. In fact, collaboration and partnership are the only ways to do this. We need to bring industry voices to governments and countries and country voices into the industry. And remember, your world is 100% coffee, but governments are juggling many, many more considerations. So we have to be organized as an industry, but this can be done. So I'd like to share an example of how we can bring demand-led research to address some of our shared problems. I'd like to share an example from the Apple industry. Now, granted, this is a difference in scale. This is a state level competitiveness question we hear in the United States as compared to country competitiveness. But the point is there are methods, others have tried them and they work. Enter the cosmic crisp apple. So this apple is the result of stakeholders from across the supply chain coming together and hashing out their priorities. Consumers want apples that don't brown when you pack them in your lunch. Consumers also want an apple that is crisp, tastes good, is juicy, and oh, by the way, it needs to be red and have good texture. So that's consumers. Farmers need an apple that is disease resistant and resilient to damage during harvesting. Given the realities of the current labor availability in Washington state where this apple was developed, farmers needed this apple to be harvested at the same time as the red delicious. So they can slide this tree into their farms and not have to worry from the industry's usual production schedules. They don't have to worry about availability of labor when this is um, when this is ripening. So that would create havoc. So it had to line up with the existing labor schedules for harvest time. Farmers and packers also needed quality retention and storage so that an apple in storage for six months tasted just as wonderful as the one that had recently been picked. This apple had to please everybody and everyone it has. There is unprecedented demand from farmers for this trees, and they're investing in a marketing campaign to educate consumers about how fabulous this fruit is. This is the kind of focus we need in coffee agricultural R&D to ensure that precious research dollars are focused on addressing the most critical goals of stakeholders along the supply chain, and that collaboration and partnership are the way that we work together to ensure we generate win-wins. So origin diversity matters. It matters for farmers, it matters for countries, and it matters for you. And it's the ultimate determinant of what's available in the cup. No single roaster, no single farmer, no single country, and no single company can do this alone. It matters that you invest in your supply chains, but we also have to think big beyond any single supply chain and think together. The story and the characters continue. The question is, where is the plot going next? Thanks, well, it's been wonderful to share with you. And I'll take it back to Peter. So much for that. Um for that talk, uh, really um, fascinating question. So 
Um, there's been a few questions in the chat, and one of them really resonated with me. I'll, I'll read. Uh, I'll, I'll read this one. Um, what can we do as coffee communities to encourage our our countries to work on coffee plans? So I think this is from a pro producer standpoint. What can what can uh, what can be done from a producer standpoint to encourage companies uh, countries to uh, work on trade and in, in coffee and development of coffee? Thanks. That, that's a fantastic question. This is exactly the challenge that many farmers around the world face in all different commodities. And what we've seen that's really been very valuable is for farmers to come together through farmer associations. Like I noted, it's really hard for a single individual, both just no one has the time as an individual to deal with these issues, you know, at the scale of a, a national, um, a national context. But if Farmers come together as a farmer association and you can hash out your priorities amongst yourselves and you bring a consolidated position to your local, your local officials or your national officials, you have so much more um, power because they generally, when you have a very large group of people who come and say they want one thing and it's very clear and it's well reasoned, you can often get a lot of progress, even in places where you would not expect. So having worked in at USAID for many years, you you would be amazed at the amount of progress that farmers can make when they band together um, to identify and define their priorities, the issues that are really the most important, and work with their government officials to tackle these challenges together. The key is is collective action. And on that point, I mean, uh, what I've noticed, we started a little poll here at the beginning, and and most of you have uh, have uh, taken it. If you if you haven't yet, click on the poll tab and and uh, and take the little poll, and it's meant to assess exactly who this audience is. And and Vern, in looking at this, I noticed that many of the of the um, of the people that are here are on the roasting and barista side. So um, there was also the question: What can roasters do to, and and consuming side people do, to support this kind of activity in in countries that may seem so far away and so so distant to us? That's absolutely an excellent question, and I think again it comes down to collective action. Um, the the kinds of organizations. So there are so many different sustainability oriented entities that are trying to coalesce and work together. So at WCR. Um, on the agricultural research and development angle of this. Um, we work closely with national governments. In fact, over the last six months, we've been consulting national governments to really understand their priorities and then bringing that information back to the roasters. In the coming months, we'll be um, aggregating all of our survey results and, and consultation information so that you all as roasters can read about what did we learn from the national governments and what is needed. So um, looking to organizations um, beyond Ag R&D, there's obviously the Global Coffee Platform, which is working um, at national level, developing multi-stakeholder platforms. That's a context in which um, if you have, as a roaster, if you have um, interest in a particular origin or work actively with a particular origin, it might behoove you to check in on the, the documents associated with that particular country's GCP multi-stakeholder group. So those are posted and available online. So there are ways to inform yourself about what's going on but then also points of contact through these multi-stakeholder mechanisms for um, learning and then engaging if you feel that that's the next step you wanna take. Great. So Michaela asks, um, would you say that agribusiness, government and smallholder partnerships will allow for preservation of origin diversity? Absolutely. I, I think actually we don't have any other choice. <laughs> I think that's, you know, you've got the one you're with, right? So we are all in this together. I think that, the, the key is, is understanding where, um, where there is a shared objective, where there are shared interests, and where there aren't. And where there are shared interests, that's where you focus your energy and try to move the agenda forward. Smallholder farmers represent the lion's share of coffee production, right? So the, if it's not like there's a choice here that we're just going to, or any part of the industry is going to say, ah, I'm not going to worry about any particular category of farmers. Smallholder farmers are the bedrock of coffee production, particularly in the washed Arabicas. And so when we're thinking about what it takes, you have to go to who your partners are and engage your partners and figure out what works for them. And I think that's the other piece here is that sometimes the answer is coffee and sometimes the answer is onions or bananas. And so when we think about what we can do collectively 
either as a government who's trying to help, you know, a government ministry of agriculture that's trying to help smallholders figure out the best deal for them based on local and global markets, intercropping might be it. So it means that the actual production of coffee might reduce from that particular farm, but the total profitability will enhance, will expand because they're going to do bananas or beans, um, you know, a different combination of crops that make sense for where they are that also help them manage reduce risk. But the other piece too, is it's not just about profit all the time. Sometimes it's about having your kids in school or making sure that the harvest time of the crop is synced up with the, the school calendar. So in the United States, there's a reason why historically, June, July, and August was the summer vacation because children had to go harvest the farm. That's the reason why our school calendar is designed the way it is. We go to school in winter and our kids come and work on the farm in the summer. And so the same situation is around the world. Educational policy is designed to respond to the realities of the country. So sometimes there are these macro things that can be put in place that frankly are already there. We just need to figure out how to take advantage of them. And so when we think about profitability for smallholders, we've got to think big and not just be too myopic. Okay, um, so talking about R and D for a second, a number of the of the audience are asking for some concrete examples of what R and D looks like in in company in countries that are invest investing heavily in in agricultural research and development. Do you have a few examples that you could share? Sure. So um, one of the first areas, of course, is um, is coffee breeding. So when you're developing a new variety of coffee, in the same way as you would develop a variety of apple, like the Cosmic Crisp you need to engage with your farmer community to understand their needs and the needs of all the different actors along the supply chain. And so um, pretty much in all the major coffee producing countries, there is coffee breeding going on. In Honduras, there's a robust coffee breeding program. In Indonesia, there's a, a very robust coffee breeding program. There are, two there are two breeders at the national level in Indonesia who are developing varieties. They're, they're evaluating material and they're developing new varieties that could respond to farmer needs. So coffee breeding is something that most origin countries have. Um, and then that is also in some countries, the place where you go get uh, planting material. So in Kenya, the, the national breeder is also responsible for making sure that the planting material is available to farmers. And so these are the kinds of um, uh, research activities that are directly linked to benefiting farmers. So coffee breeding would be one um, area of investment. Another one that's really critical, obviously, is um, you know research around what is the optimal plant spacing. So if your grandparents planted coffee one way because the world economy made that production approach profitable, that's great. It worked for them. But when we think about the price volatility of coffee and perhaps the desire to do intercropping and maybe bring in another crop, you might need to space your plants differently. So that would be a research question. If we space them in this way, we can grow beans. If we space them in this other way, we can grow bananas and we can get the dual benefit of shade. So those are the kinds of questions like, okay, what worked for my grandparents based on global economics and the environment, climate change is changing what works. So there's a lot of knowledge from history that we can draw on and everyone does. That's, the, that's what farmers do is they take what's been working and try that and when that stops working, they need new innovations. And that's where intercropping research, understanding plant spacing, which crop, what's the best deal for farmers? That's the kind of research question that's really, really specific and germane to today's questions for which there aren't answers from 20 years ago because the context just wasn't there. Um, there are a couple questions about um, current events, particularly COVID-19. Um, is, is it your sense that those, the advent of COVID-19 is going to have an impact on agricultural research and development in these countries? I think COVID-19 is going to have an impact on everything that everyone does everywhere. I think that we have, just as an example, um, WCR has a team members in, in 15 different countries and when we do our all staff calls, all of us in every country from Indonesia to Kenya to Nicaragua, everybody has been staying at home because of the COVID-19 crisis. That's the first time that everybody is all affected by the same thing at the same time in every country where we operate. COVID-19 is a pandemic of a lifetime. It's going to affect things. How it affects ag r and specifically, I think that um, it's a question of where research happens, 
When research happens far away from the research station, obviously if tra travel is affected, agricultural R&D is affected. I think that um, our ability to develop new models and methods for partnering with, with farming communities to do some of this research is a really critical thing that has to happen anyway. And COVID-19 probably is going to accelerate that. If researchers at the main station can't get out to the farm, we really are relying on the farmer's partnership to help collect those data and ensure that we're moving the research forward because when all this blows over and we finally have a vaccine and there's finally relief on the horizon, farmers are gonna need responses to climate change because climate change is not, um, is not gonna go away. So here's a big picture question from the audience and I'll read it. Why is it important to depend on agricultural activity? I don't quite understand the comparison with New Zealand. So it comes down to um, countries. So you take Kenya, for instance. Um, a lot of the, the Arabica production area in Kenya is right around Nairobi. So if we wanna keep buying coffee from Kenya, the really high quality coffee that we've all grown to love and we all have loved, if it's a better deal for a coffee farmer to just lease their land to a developer to turn it into a shopping mall for the burgeoning population of Nairobi, that coffee production land that has historically been really important for the quality side of the coffee industry, it's just not available anymore. That land is no longer gonna produce coffee. If we look at uh, Kenya's coffee production decline, it's precipitous. They have um, the lowest uh, production levels in, in decades have happened in recent, in recent years. If we want Kenyan coffee, it has to be competitive with other opportunities in the economy. So my point about New Zealand is, it's about choices. Things don't just happen. Policies are made and governments make choices to sort of strengthen parts of the economy. So when you're thinking about New Zealand, they made choices to ensure that sheep production is a profitable activity and dairy production is a profitable activity so that those components of their economy are strong and have the support that they need and those farmers are prosperous. When we think about preserving origin diversity, particularly in East Africa where economies are growing really fast and opportunity is just the blue sky. I mean, there's amazing things you can do across East Africa that may not have anything to do with coffee. That means that those origins may become less compelling. If I'm a farmer and my children got to go to college and they have choices, do they wanna come back and farm the coffee or do they wanna go become a dentist in the city? They have to make a choice. And so when we think about intentionally supporting governments as they develop these policies to keep coffee on their radar, it's not like having agriculture as, your, as a big and important part of your economy means that you're gonna stay poor forever. New Zealand is this, this way that it's been done. I mean, I mean it, there's a lot of reasons why that works, but the point is, is we've got to look for models and think about and ideate models for how robust agriculture in coffee and keeping coffee going will allow all the rest of us to enjoy the wonderfulness of Kenyan coffee, even if maybe right now it's not the best priority for their economy, if the innovations are available and make it so profitable that it's competitive with a shopping mall option, you might have a shake. And R&D is really the only way you get there. In every other mature economy in the world, agricultural R&D is what helped them, helped governments shift their relative allocation of effort to agriculture. But we as a coffee community want to keep buying coffee from lots of different places because it's so cool and it tastes really interesting and there's all these amazing things you can do. But we need to partner with our partners in each country and help them make it a good deal for them. Because if it's not a good deal, they're going to do something else. So we're here um, met under the auspices of the Specialty Coffee Association. But we all know that, that producers have to make a choice between producing specialty level quality and, and perhaps a, a commodity style coffee. Um, we had a question about with in, in the context of COVID-19 and knowing that the, uh, the supply chain is, is going to be disrupted somewhat because of it. Um, do you have any thoughts about um, whether producers should focus on one kind of, of coffee or the other? In other words, specialty versus commodity coffee? So um, that is outside of my area of expertise, but I can point you to places where they are thinking about that. There are forecast and trade statistics at ICO. There's, um, there are World Bank publications. We'll, we'll put up some of these. Um, we'll send them through to you, Peter, after, because I 
I have a couple in my mind that I can offer. But I think at the end of the day, um, what's most important for farmers who are making a decision about 20 years, when you think about pivoting between a high quality product and maybe commercial coffee, the question you have to ask yourself is what is the long-term consequence? COVID is a moment in time, but 15 years from now, will that have been the right decision for you then also? And so always to keep that, I mean, farmers know better than me for sure. <laughs> you always wanna keep the long-term horizon in mind and where are you trying to get to? But there are forecasted statistics out of the World Bank that could be useful. Um, obviously talking to traders and listening to the demand signal in the markets is also super helpful, getting a better handle on what they, um, what they know. And, um, and obviously public institutions will have you know, more neutral advice insofar as you're looking for neutral advice, the World Bank and the ICO. Great. Um, okay, so speaking of institutions like the World Bank and ICO, we had an institutions question um, and I'll read it. Do you see a need for a new platform or platforms within the coffee industry to further this goal of collaboration with national governments or working primarily through the existing organizations you mentioned? Are there other partners outside the coffee industry that we should be partnering with when considering the priorities of national governments? That's a good question. Um, that's a great question. And I would say using my old government hat instead of my current WCR hat, my answer would be the most important thing is to, um, you know, change starts at home, right? So getting yourselves organized, getting ourselves, yourselves, ourselves, <laughs> us coffee people, getting ourselves organized within the frame of the organizations we have. There are, there's a tremendous number of platforms. And I think at the end of the day, it's just a question of, we just have to make them work, right? We have the mechanisms in the community. There are a number of different angles, depending on what matters to you most, whether it's economic sustainability, um, environmental sustainability, all of those different goals are important. It's not that they're not important. And we have the mechanisms to tackle them. And we have nexus organizations like SCA that can help sort of direct traffic and help you find an entity that really resonates with what you're doing and what you're interested in. At the end of the day, having a clear understanding within the industry is critical to then going out and working with national governments. Because if you don't have a single clear goal, then national government wants to say, do you notice that I'm dealing with COVID-19 and I'm dealing with the, you know, the crisis in the, you know, water quality in the urban areas? Like governments have so many challenges. You just can't appreciate it until you've been in their shoes. And um, when they meet with you, they want you to tell them what is it that you want and what's the rational basis for why you're asking for this. You're asking for better roads. Why? What is the significance of that economic activity in that area of the country that would justify the allocation of resources to build a road or to improve a road where coffee's coming, right? So I think the bottom line is there are many organizations in the coffee community just coming as a novice. I've only been here for a year, but I would say you all have the mechanisms you need. You need to make them work and you need to be inclusive. And I think inclusive is the key. It's I mean, it sounds annoying because it sounds so basic, and yet it is what works. You have to have everybody in the conversation because you'll miss things that you didn't realize were important. But you start with your own community, you start with coffee, and then you work out um, tech issue by issue and you engage the relevant national authority when you have a plan. Because there's nothing more annoying as a government official than having people come and describe a problem, but they have no solution. There's that, so like, I'm supposed to solve your problem? Like, I'm solving everyone's problems. So government officials need you to come with a really well-reasoned explanation, description of the problem. You don't have to have all the solutions, but you have to have some ideas to get a conversation going. And then they can say, ah, okay, so then you need to go talk to these people in the government because they actually deal with things like urban planning or you know infrastructure management. And so the point is, is like organization, use the mechanisms you have. I don't think we, our community does not need another entity to do this. We just need to lean in and make them work the ones that we have and hold everyone accountable. Yeah. So you touched a little bit on process there like how you know how things are, are done and there was a qu few questions about that um and so maybe i'll summarize them this way is there any standard sort of methodology that 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 um that countries go through in order to develop um ag agricultural r d and uh, there was another question that touched on something the the question of inclusivity um uh is it important um that that it uh let's say producers, small producers, and their lived experience gets included in that R&D process. Absolutely, and in fact, you always start with the customer. Like, so from an agricultural R&D perspective, you start with who is the person 
who's most affected by this. And you identify your the clients. Who is it that needs to address? The lived experience of a farmer, farmers deal with tremendous risk. They deal with tremendous challenges. They're constantly juggling, you know, if I spend money on fertilizer, that means that I won't be able to go to the clinic or I won't be able to pay school fees for my child. They're constantly dealing with so many considerations and, and solving for many at a time. They're like incredible algorithm solvers because they have so much complexity in their lives. And that's exactly why researchers should start with farmers and understand the context in which they're operating and what would really be beneficial. Agricultural R&D can't solve everything. Like let's not pretend that it can. But um, social policy, social safety nets, these are all, comp uh, every mature uh, rich economy has sorted this out in one way or another. You, you can't solve everything with R&D, but at the beginning you need to make sure that the R&D is generating relevant, innovations that solve farmers' problems. And ideally, you're solving everybody's agenda at the same time, like the cosmic crisp apple, which is ad essentially addressed farmer concerns. They started with farmers. If this thing heart was ripening at a different time, off the table, farmers are never gonna let it get to consumers. It's dead in the water. And so that wonderful apple that never browns when you put it in your lunch, that tastes crisp and is juicy, would never have been experienced by consumers if it didn't solve farmers' problems. And the lived experience of farmers is, a, is an absolutely integrated part of this um, when developing develop, research and development uh, priorities. The process question, every government's different. And I think this idea that we can paint the world with one brush even though we're all coffee, every country's different. And everyone who's been to origin or who, who lives in an origin production country, you know that your country is different than the country next door. Um, even if you speak the same language, there are different contexts, different history, different climate, different political um, realities. So when it comes to process, the most important place to start is it's all, all politics is local. And so starting at the national level and, and working through the issues that are the most important to work through for that community to stay competitive. Um, I, I love hearing you talk about the Cosmic Crisp Apple because I can tell you're a plant breeder um, in your heart. You get so excited about breeding. And so I've got a plant breeding question for you. And the question um, comes in, is there a tension vis-a-vis -vis focusing on producing a few high performing varieties and the conservation of full genetic diversity? And second, how is this diversity uh, accessible by breeders that most need it throughout the world? It's a great question. So um, I'm gonna unpack it into three parts. One is is um, accessing genetic diversity. Uh, genetic diversity is something that is the sovereign wealth and sovereign rights of national governments. National governments hold the power and control over their own genetic resources. Insofar as those materials have moved across borders historically or legally in more recent times, um, uh, then that is, the, that is the material that breeders have to work with. And so through partnership and collaboration, um, breeders in countries can work with each other to access material. But at the end of the day, genetic resources are the sovereign rights of nations. It's theirs. <laughs> and so um, when it comes down to how coffee is going to contend with the challenges of climate change and the diversity of, of um, uh, the diversity that the, the customer base is asking for, um, we need to develop new ways. So there, I mean, there are options on the horizon. There's crossing with other species. There's 123, 125 species of coffee that um, can be used to, um, to develop new innovations. And that's an area that's been completely under examined. Um, Arabica and Robusta are just two of all of those. Um, there's also the question of um, how breeders can make, uh, make progress in, in coffee breeding. There is genetic diversity available outside. Many governments have it. Cartier has made its materials and its uh, its collection available under Article 15 of the Plant Treaty. I used to be a plant treaty person, so <laughs> I'm always supporting plant treaty. Um, but uh, Cartier has made those avail materials available for the global community under the terms of the Standard Material Transfer Agreement, which is an international, um, uh, internationally agreed uh, material transfer agreement that allows you to take um, the materials from Cartier and just make sure that you're using them in ways that are consistent with the terms of the treaty. So um, Cartier has made material available. Everyone can access that under those terms. Um, material belongs to governments and it's their, it's their competitive advantage. And that's what makes some countries able to do go much further down the field because they have those natural endowments and other countries have different natural endowments. So it just comes down to, to that. 
Was there another part of the question, Peter, that I didn't catch? No, I think, I think you got it. Great. Um, as we bring this to a close here, I have one more question that a few people ask, which is how do we talk to coffee consumers about this? Um, how can we engage coffee consumers in this conversation? That is a fantastic question. And I would um, kick it back to the community that this is, this is a challenge for all of us. Um, I think as citizens, as drinkers of coffee, and as those of us in the industry who are trying to support this wonderful, wonderful crop, um, we need collective action and education is the first step. Um, I think in talking to consumers, it comes down to what resonates for them and starting where people are. Not everybody understands the challenges of agricultural production, even in, uh, in their own country, um, much less in other countries and the challenges those farmers face. And so I think the first step is start where consumers are, and it's a stepwise and slow education process. When I worked in government, that's how you start. You wanna make sure that the citizens of your country understand what you're doing and you bring them along. And I think it just starts with education. The first step to a long journey is the first step. Great, thank you so much for that. And um, that's a perfect place to uh, end. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but I know, um, Vern and World Coffee Research are very active on social media and very responsive to questions. So any other questions, you can certainly direct there. Um, and um, with that, I will uh, thank Vern so much for your time this morning. And um, also thank uh, our sponsors. Uh, once again, Pacific Barista is our title uh, sponsor for this lecture series. Saver Brands, Chemex, and Roastar underwriting, all of this would be impossible without them. So thanks. Vern, thanks all the people that helped put this together. And thanks most of all, um, all of you who um, spent your time on a Saturday to uh, come listen to us talk about coffee. So um, thanks everyone. Again, I'm Peter Giuliano with the Specialty Coffee Association and um, we'll see you in the next lecture. <laughs>